Okay, thank you. Well, <coughs> welcome to my talk here. The title of the talk is To the Moon and Back, Software Defined Radio and High Power Transmissions. And the subtitle is How to Do Cool Things and Stay Legal. Um, my name is Marcus, and DL8RDS is my call sign. Um, we were having a little stand down there, and uh, we noticed many people with a call sign. So let, let me please first ask you, how many people of you have a call sign? Wow. <laughs> 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 wow, okay, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> well, I expected about five or ten, but not so many. <laughs> okay, so then most of you have at least uh, kind of an insight from your own practical hobby from from your own doing <coughs> um, well then let's start um, the call sign is actually something that's important exactly here <coughs> up there because this wonderful little device transmits about 10 milliwatts and okay the licensed people among you know how far you can get with 10 milliwatts but uh, a question to the others who don't have a license. How far do you get with 10 milliwatts? Let's say on short wave, what do you think? Give me guesses. Give me some numbers. Yeah. Kilometers. A thousand? A thousand? Yeah, yeah, that's an important <laughs> point. Very important <laughs> point. <coughs> so the next talk uh, will be from, from Michael, and uh, Michael will present a little device, a little Raspberry. Uh, with a just a, a wire attached to it, and he threw the wire out of the window down there, and he was able to bridge um, a few hundred kilometers over to England just with this little wire attached to a Raspberry. So, Raspberry does 10 milliwatts, <coughs> so it's worth thinking about how far you can get with small power. And actually, what's so interesting about uh, Moonbound is that all those aspects high power and low power comes very close together, even though they're completely different and they require completely different approaches. So, now let's start. Um, that's a nice array, it's not mine. <laughs> um, what does it take? It takes a very, very good antenna to go to the moon. Very good antenna. The, the moon is somewhere between 405 thousand and three hundred thirty thousand kilometers away it's quite a distance let's let's take four hundred thousand kilometers in that case and you have the way back so that's eight hundred thousand kilometers and uh, that also brought me to the idea well was Apollo really on the moon <coughs> and um, from from well thinking about what is possible what is not clearly it was possible and it is possible and the guys who do that, my friends, uh, they told me that actually you can stand on the moon with a 20 watt transmitter and transmit to the earth and somebody on the earth will hear you. That is possible. <coughs> What's so problematic about moon bounce is that the moon is a very bad reflector. The moon has a very uneven surface <coughs> and it is round, which means the waves come up here, maybe there is a little mountain and the wave will be deflected over here. And um, even, if, even if the moon is even here, the wave comes here, but it will be deflected somewhere else. So just a very small portion of the power that really hits the moon. I mean, you don't put all the power on the moon because the antenna is usually not so, so narrow. You go beyond the moon and just a very small portion of the power will be reflected. And the science about it is, first of all, how to put as much power as you can on the moon and how to pick up as much power as you can from the little amount of power that's going back. That's also somebody who has quite an area in, in his garden. Um, there is also something about antennas because antennas have a certain gain. Um, the funny thing about amateur radio is that we are kind of limited in the amount of power that comes out here. But the limitation is kind of relative because in depending on the country, 
you can put out here a power of 1,000 watts legally. And that's the funny thing about it, <coughs> but it gets even funnier because everybody of you has been playing around with magnifying glasses. You can of course magni uh, you can of, of course concentrate all the power to a certain spot, and this is what a good antenna does. So if you have an antenna that focuses everything into one direction and produces a very, very small beam, you can make sure that all of your power really goes where you want to have it. And this is kind of a device like that. <coughs> but this is also possible. Uh, that's kind of, yeah, it's mobile operation over the moon. Uh, the antenna is a two meter antenna. It's about 10 meters long. And uh, that also works. I've been talking quite a lot about antennas. Obviously, antennas play a, an important, a very crucial, very, very, very important role. And I take the jump from the antenna to filters because uh, in the morning, Tom told us that an antenna is eventually a filter. When you have power distributed over a spectrum, that's the frequency, that's the power. <coughs> and if it's evenly distributed, now let's take a higher power level, <coughs> evenly distributed, and you have an antenna, the antenna has a resonance, and it will only pick up what's in this resonance uh, bulb like, well, if this is the resonance, <coughs> then this is what it picks up. <coughs> And of course, you want to make sure that it picks up as much as it can. Um, but there is something else that's important about software-defined radio and reality. That's the question about the dynamics of the analog-digital analog converter, which means if you have background, all, sort of kind, all kinds of transmitters, um, LTE base stations, broadcast transmitters, everything, all of that energy will come into your receiver. Every <coughs> all of that energy will go in. And the ADC sees, okay, there is, there is an amplitude. Um, it samples the amplitude at a certain point of time, uh, no matter what kind of frequency that is, first of all. Later on, you can tell, okay, you can calculate it out, but it's uh, on that on that uh, that's the reason why it's very important to, well, for example, this is the this is the this is what the antenna picks up, and this is the frequency which you really want to hear, and if there is a trans or a strong signal about here, the antenna will also pick it up, but uh, what comes in into the line will be the energy of both signals. Um, and the big signal that's up here will eventually um, reduce the sensitivity of your receiver so that you cannot pick up the very, very weak signal which you really want to hear. And that's the reason why it's very reasonable uh, <laughs> to, to put the filter, a narrow filter here, so that you uh, blank out all the rest which you don't want to hear. And this is what you put into your ADC. <coughs> now let's have a look at the uh, let's have a look at the link budget. How to calculate that? One milliwatt is zero dBm. It's a logarithmic scale, as we heard several times this day. One watt is thirty dBm. One kilowatt is sixty dBm. In Germany, we have a maximum legal limit of uh, seven hundred fifty, which is a few dBm's less. But after all, the dBm's here. I mean, since the antenna focuses it. You can't really tell it's a 1,000 watt signal from a 750 watt signal. That's just a, a little weaker or stronger, but that's not really the point. Let's calculate the round. Let's take the round figures because it's easier to calculate. <coughs> um, if you have a good Yagi antenna on two meters, on the two meter band, 144 megahertz, you will have about uh, 14. Uh, 14 dBd or dBi. dBi is uh, referring to the uh, to to a r um, radiation 
um, uh, to, to a ball that radiates in all directions, but it doesn't exist in reality because uh, um, an oscillation always happens between two points and it disturbs the idea or the, the, the uh, crashes your idea that uh, it, transmit it transmits in into all directions. So after all, <coughs> the isotrophic uh, um, a body does not exist in, in reality. It's just a theoretical matter. So anyway, if you have a 14 dB antenna, dBi antenna, <coughs> and if you if you take two of these antennas, you gain three decibel. And if you take four antennas, you gain another three decibel. And after all, you will end up at 20 decibel gain. Um, this is the gain which you can add to your transmission power because it's um, it is practically your the concentration of your signal into the direction which you want to have. So what comes out in front of your antenna is 80 dBm, which is 100 kilowatts, and it is more or less legal. <laughs> I mean, if, if we have 750 watts in Germany, so you have to deduct a little bit, but that's not the big portion. In America, the legal limits are uh, uh, I think one and a half kilowatts, so even a little more. <coughs> so 100 kilowatts is completely legal. Um, but this example refers to the two meter band and not to the antenna here. Because this antenna very, very likely has a gain of 40 to 50 decibel. So you have to add 50 decibel instead of the 20 decibel. <coughs> um, at home in my experimentation site, we have a dish of three meters, diam uh, three meters diameter, and we have, such we have a crazy idea. It's called the chicken project. <laughs> 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 That's the idea of roasting a chicken at 100 meters distance. <laughs> 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 we haven't tried it out yet. <laughs> <coughs> okay, but that's for the calculation. <laughs> in front of the antenna, that's the, <laughs> the ERP, you come out with 100 kilowatts, and then you send your energy to the moon. <coughs> the way to the moon is quite easy still, but the reflection is the problem. So the path attenuation overall at about uh, 140 megahertz is 250 decibel. This is what you have to deduct. That's why I have a minus in front. And this is what comes out, 170. This is the signal strength that comes back to the Earth, the signal strength in front of your antenna. And now the antenna helps you again, because since it is 20 dB, uh, has an according focusing power, it, um, it gives you 20 decibels. Um, that's the antenna gain. And then you, in this case, in these applications, you usually have a preamplifier. So wonderful devices with, with a PH EMG uh, um, <coughs> transistor, a very low noise transistor, fantastic things, uh, fantastic devices. And after all, you end up at 100 and minus 130 dBm. And then you have a trick because it always depends on the, on the uh, on the breadth of the signal. If you have a very broad signal or a very narrow signal, that helps you also quite a lot. Here in this case, uh, I'm talking about 10 decibel, but this, this varies very much uh, according to the kind of, well, how you use, how you use and how you decode the, the signal which you want to hear afterwards. In this case, we end up at minus 120. This is one watt, milliwatt, microwatt, nanowatt, picowatt. And one picowatt is detectable. That is possible. And this is how you can hear a signal from, from the moon, your own signal. And if the computer or if the presentation doesn't crash, because it did it several times, because this file is so, uh, so big, that's a reflection from the moon. And um, that's on the two meter band. And um, 
here very closely, this is Morse code. <coughs> okay, should be sufficient to demonstrate wha what the effect is. Morse code is a binary transmission because the power goes out and that's it. There is no modulation on it. So the energy level of the signal rises instantly and it terminates instantly. But since signals come here at the, uh, at the nearest point of the moon and they're reflected a little further, there is a, a time delay. And even further down here, maybe there is a mountain. It will also be reflected. This means that those sharp edges come out in the end. Well, there is a three, three second delay anyway, but let's project it onto it. Like, uh, like this, and at the end, it, it's it's like the effect from from a capacitor. It's it will be delayed a little, and the, the signal is not so well detectable uh, anymore. There are people who do um, um, voice transmissions also over the moon, and that's kind of the problem why they're very very hard to understand, and that's also the reason why many people prefer telegraphy over the moon because the signals are much easier to detect. As you, as you could hear, you could very clearly distinguish, okay, there is a tone and there is no more tone. And if you can do that, old or older amateurs uh, in Germany, it's no longer required to pass the telegraphy uh, test. I did it and I can just read that. I can, it's like somebody's talking to me. I can just listen to that. It's just a matter of training. Okay, my job with my presentation. Yeah, LibreOffice is kind of weird sometimes. <coughs> so, I think I have to continue this way. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. Well, you can see the sky. <coughs> uh, Morse code is something that can make a lot of fun uh, if you if you have learned how to how to uh, write write it and listen to it. Um, but there are better ways to do it. And uh, the person who is depicted here, that's uh, Joe Taylor. A Nobel Prize winner, a radio astronomer who used to work on uh, at the MIT, and uh, he he did a lot of research on pulsars. And when he retired <coughs> at the age of 65, he decided. Well, he was an amateur radio operator, K1JT. He decided that he wanted to do something in amateur radio with the background knowledge of his profession, and um, he wrote a program. The WSJT and the WSJT program was designed for moon bounce transmissions. It's called weak signal communications by K1JT. K1J uh, the uh, WSJT has a number of derivatives for all sorts of applications, not just for moon bounce, but also for uh, shortwave transmissions. Uh, one of those applications will be presented afterwards by Michael. <coughs> and it's also. Uh, a way to use uh, or a way to analyze very low energy signals. <coughs> Here, the signal in this case consists of uh, 65 tones. Um, there is one lead tone, one synchronization tone, and 64 tones for uh, transporting information. And um, the way how to do that is you connect a receiver to the computer through the sound card. In this case, it's not like this. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk depictively about this because this is really a fantastic device, but techno technologically, after all, this is something like a sound card, a very, very fast sound card. And um, in this case, uh, WSJT do does something similar. It takes the uh, input from the sound card and does a lot of uh, transformations, particularly the fast Fourier transformation uh, by which it can uh, analyze 
signals um, way or uh, much weaker than the background noise. And that's the interesting part about it. Um, it also, uh, the, the, the transmission also relies on a fixed format, well, depending on the, on the modes, there are different modes. But here in this case, the first, um, the first uh, version relies on a, on, a, on a fixed format. And it also has a very, very slow uh, baud rate, just two baud. <coughs> You'll see that in the next slide, uh, one of the next slides. Um, a more or less precise PC clock is also required. And one transmission can, can transfer 13 characters. It's not very much, but given that you transmit it over 800,000 kilometers, this is quite interesting nevertheless. What's in the, in the standard transmission? Your call sign, or the call sign of the sender. Uh, a report in DBM, it's not DB, it's DBM, how strong the signal is. So when I'm sending, I, I tell all the others, okay, my signal is 10 milliwatts. Uh, and my locator, so where I am located. And the receiver can then say, okay, um, the signal goes from here over the moon to there. <coughs> here is a screenshot how it looks like. Maybe, oops, no, it has not re recovered in the meantime. Wait a moment, please. Let's do it the hard way. Is this one no next one? Okay, restart. Okay, okay. Try it again. <coughs> I hope it doesn't crash again. There are some technical problems ahead. Well, the mistake was to embed the sound file in the presentation. This is probably something you shouldn't do if it's very big. <coughs> okay, here we go. Well, now I'm, jump I'm just jumping to this slide here and hope to make it a little bigger. Then you can read that. <coughs> These figures are very small here, but they're the most interesting ones. Um, you see the JT65A mode here has a baud rate of 2.69, and the, SN, uh, the um, SNR is minus 25. And that's the interesting thing. You can detect a signal that is as weak as 25 decibel below noise. And that's really, really fantastic. And uh, unfortunately, I've not yet seen a re-implementation of WSJT and GNU Radio, which should be possible because it's open source. Uh, you can download and, and compile it yourself. <laughs> and um, that would be something really fantastic. And if somebody of you uh, can implement that, <coughs> I would be very, very happy. So, <coughs> uh, those of you who already have a call sign don't need to worry about that. But for the others, uh, I have good news because there are lots of frequencies which you can use. Uh, amateur radio frequencies start from 135 kilohertz and go up to, uh, uh, doesn't start here, uh, way beyond 250 gigahertz. So you can, you can play in all of those 
uh, frequency ranges and uh, it goes from, from kilometer waves to, to millimeter waves and you, you have all sorts of, uh, of funny things which you can play ar uh, with which you can play around. <coughs> You don't. You, you probably don't believe what's there that reflects everything. Reflects. Uh, it's incredible. Just recently, I heard um, an example that somebody is doing uh, rain reflections. I mean, of course, you, you all, all of you know there is a rain radar in the internet. So, rain reflects radio signals, and you can send a signal into a rain cloud, which is 10,000 meters high and it will reflect far beyond the horizon. You can talk to other people through a <laughs> rain cloud. It's possible. Um, <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> That's a real cloud application. <laughs> <coughs> um, something else that's very funny, of course, you can use airplanes to talk over them. You send a signal to an airplane and the airplane will reflect it far beyond the horizon because the airplane is also, is also 10,000 kilometers up and uh, you can talk to other people through a reflection on an airplane. There are applications how to do that. People do that. And um, this is why as I tell you that amateur radio is a lot of fun. It's a playground for curious people. And um, if you have questions how to do that, there are people who know how to do it. Uh, almost In almost every country there is a a radio club in Germany. We have the DRC, Deutsche Amateur Radio Club. Uh, club. Um, here in Belgium, you have the UBA, <coughs> and um, contact them. They will tell you how to get a license, and it's not so difficult. Since you're sitting here and you're interested in radio, it should be easy for you to pass a license exam. It's not so difficult. I did it when I was 14 years old. So everybody of you can do that. Right. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> to count birds? I haven't. But why not? Should be possible. They do reflect for sure. Okay, thank you very much.